Let's see. There we go. Okay, so welcome back to the second part of our important Android stuff talk. And this time we're gonna, going to talk about tools and techniques. Sort of. Uh, sort of, mostly techniques, really. Um, and if any of you were not here in the previous uh, half, uh, this is Chad Haas and I'm Roman Gain. We both work on the Android team at Google and we focus on animations, graphics, and performance. What if they were here? If you were here, we're still Chad Haas and Roman Gain, <laughs> but we work at a different company. Okay, uh, so we're going to start with a few tools. Um, and this slide is important to you because the Android 4.2 OTA update uh, started this morning. <gasps> Uh, so it's slowly rolling out, so you might get uh, an update if you have a Nexus 1 or a uh, Nexus 7, sorry, not a Nexus 1, no. Uh, a Nexus 7 or Galaxy Nexus, you might get uh, an OTA today, and we'll probably take down the Wi-Fi network because of that. Yes. Uh, but we have new developer options. Uh, so developer options are in settings. So normally you launch settings, and then you go to the developer options category. Um, How do we get there? Yeah, so bummer, in Android 4.2 you won't find developer options anywhere. Uh, yet, it's still there. Um, we decided to hide um, developer options by default because uh, a lot of users were messing with it and actually had to deal with a lot of bug reports coming from our own QA or even you know, random users or reviewers and they complain that it's weird, the screen is flashing. I'm like, well, yeah, you turned on the option that says, please flash the screen. <laughs> um, so now it's hidden, but you can bring it back. We're going to put an app on, on uh, Google Play uh, to help you bring that back in your settings. Or, there's another trick. My favorite. My favorite as well. You can go to about phone or about tablet, find the build number at the bottom, and if you tap that build number seven times, developer options will reappear. Let's be very clear. The real way to do this is through the developer's tool app. I can just see the bug reports and the screams yeah. on the blogs now about how dumb this was to enable it through a seven tap. Now, no. That's the, just a silly way to do it. The good news is uh, we remember that you've enabled developer options, so if you restart the phone, you don't have to do it again. You only have to do it again if you get, I think, a new update. So if it disappears, just go tap the build number seven times again. And when you tap it, you get a little toast that says, you know, you're seven taps away from being a developer, you're six <laughs> taps away from being a developer. So it, it's a little fun, you know, I guess. <laughs> yeah, we live a side life. We find amusement where we can. Uh, so those are the options I want to talk about today. Um, some of them are new, some of them were there before. So the first one is called Show GPU View Updates. Uh, if you turn that on, we're going to flash uh, red all the views, like the parts of the screen that update when you run with hardware acceleration. There's also a way to do that when you're running in software, uh, but it's always been there. Uh, this new, but it doesn't work with hardware acceleration. Well, actually, it works too well. The old way flashes the entire window every time you draw something. So show GPU view updates uh, helps you optimize your application and minimize the amount of pixels that you have to redraw on every frame. Show hardware layer updates. So in the previous uh, talk, we talked about using layers, especially for animations. And layers are really useful um, when they don't update. The goal is to capture a frame, to capture a view in, inside a texture, and then to animate that texture. If you update the layer on every frame, it's actually more expensive than not having the layer at all. So if you turn that on, if you turn on show hardware layer updates, um, the layers will turn green every time we have to redraw them. Uh, you can try that options if you go back to launcher, for instance, you can see how launcher uses layers. Um, a caveat for all these options, some of them require that you kill your application uh, to, to, to have the option take effect. Uh, one of the reasons is uh, I was lazy um, to you know, make the application speak that up dynamically. The other reason is they're pretty intrusive. So if, we, if, you don't kill, if, we, if you didn't have to kill the application, certainly every app that you have running, including settings that you're messing with, will start flashing all over the place and it will be pretty annoying. Show GPU Overdraw is a new one in 4.2 that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Profile GPU rendering, uh, we're going to talk about that one in more details during our talk called Pro uh, For Better or Worse on Thursday. Uh, it's a way to see how much time you're spending uh, drawing on screen. Enable OpenGL traces is very useful if you use OpenGL directly. So if you write a game or if you have OpenGL in your application, uh, you, can in, you can trace OpenGL in different ways, but uh, all of them are very useful. And I'd like to show that if we have time at the end of the talk. And finally, uh, Enable Traces um, is used by our new tool called SysTrace that we introduced in 4.1. And we're going to talk about SysTrace in more details in our talk, uh, Project Butter, for better or worse, on Thursday. So we're done with tools, but now techniques. So uh, alpha is a new property that we added on Vue in 3.0 uh, so that we could animate fades, essentially. But you can also just 
call the setter or the getter directly and say set alpha on this thing and you can have a, a translucent view on the screen, which is great. In fact, it, in particular, it's great for fades. It's a very easy way to affect this object to fade it in, fade it out, sort of transition the user from here to there in the UI. Um, it's also useful to dim things out uh, on a permanent basis. However, it does cause us to do a lot more work on your behalf. So uh, actually, let's step through this a little bit. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can trigger this capability. A lot of different methods and properties. You can use object animators that call into the set alpha method. You can call set alpha directly. You can use the new alpha property object property with a capital P uh, to set the value of alpha to a non one or non zero value. Uh, you can use a view property animator that fades just like object animator. Uh, you can save layer alpha or you can use an old style alpha animation. All of these ways are essentially bottoming out in the same capability of making us do more work. Um, we love doing work, uh, but you probably don't love us doing work on your behalf if you can prevent it. Um, so here's the problem, is that when we draw a view on the screen, we just draw it directly into that surface. In the hardware acceleration case, we're using GL commands to just draw these commands into the display surface that gets uh, put on the display. Um, but when we have been told to have a translucent view. Instead, what we do is create a temporary buffer, draw into that buffer, and then copy that back to the display surface, blending it with the pixels that are there already. There's like at least three or four times the amount of work going on there. Some of that work is quite expensive, creating things on the fly, uploading new things to the GPU, the blending operation may be more expensive, and some of this may be dependent on the capabilities of the hardware as well. So a lot more stuff going on. We can see it visually in some diagrams here. Basically, when you don't have alpha enabled, uh, when you, things aren't translucent, they're just opaque, all we're doing is just drawing these things directly into the display. If, however, we enable alpha on the view in which we're trying to operate, uh, do these operations, then we create this temporary buffer. We do the same drawing operations to the buffer, buffer, and then we copy with this blend operation along the way. Kind of expensive, but also kind of important. You might wonder, well, why can't you just draw with alpha on each of these operations? Um, the problem is you get the kind of drawing effect um, or artifact that you see here. On the left is basically what you don't want. If you have a view with several objects in it, let's say <coughs> it's a, a button with a background and text, um, or it's, you know, in this case, it's a custom view. This is one of these folders on home screen. If we actually drew a dimmed out version of that folder with all of the sub objects in, uh, in it, you know, this is a container with sub views, and we just drew those views on top of each other, each one with alpha, then they would each be blended with each other translucently, and you get this really garbagey effect. It's kind of subtle in some cases. Um, but it's really disturbing when it happens in others like here. What you really want us to do in an alpha uh, translucent view is to draw everything that that view has opaquely, normally, and then blend the entire result. Um, so then you get something more like what we have on the right, where the entire container is blended, not each of the items in the container piecemeal. So this is what you want. Unfortunately, that's going to cost you by having the temporary buffer approach that we uh, saw in the diagrams in the previous slides. So there are some alternatives. Use alpha if you need to. In particular, when you're doing fades, there's not really much of a way around it. And this is one of the reasons to keep fades short and temporary. Um, so go ahead and use alpha if you need to. But don't if there's other ways around it. Um, so an example that we saw internally, we see a lot of application code and system code where people are actually using our code so that we can tune the platform before we ship. Um, and in this case, it's a good thing because the person said, you know what, I don't really want that full on white color for my text. What I really like is kind of a 70% gray. So I'm going to do a set alpha 70, uh, 0.7 on the view that had the text in it. So basically, he was causing us to, uh, and I say he generically, it could have been anybody. It was um, a he, actually. <laughs> it was a he. Uh, I will blame him for it. He was a doctor, it. even. <laughs> he still is, actually. He had a PhD in setting alpha. Uh, he was setting alpha on the entire view, which meant that we were drawing the background, we were drawing the text, we were creating a buffer that was this big, all so that he could have gray text in one little piece of this view. What he really needed to do was simply use a different text color, for example, or even set alpha directly on the paint that he was using to draw text. There's a lot of different approaches that we can see. Um, but in some cases, you're actually going to care about that. That actually caused delays in the system UI because we were spending so much effort creating this temporary buffer on the fly every time we drew the thing. 
Um, so one of the workarounds, for instance, is to simply use the color you want. If you actually want a translucent color, that's fine. Let's say you're on a complicated background. Translucent text is going to be different than dimmer, opaque text. Okay, that's fine. You can use alpha, but you can actually set a color that has alpha embedded in it, and then we will draw that text directly with that alpha color as opposed to drawing everything into a temporary buffer and copying it in. So this is one workaround specifically for the text case. You can also set alpha directly um, on an image view. So instead of setting alpha on the view itself, you can set the image alpha, which basically tells us the alpha to draw the inside uh, image of an image view with. So there's this may be a little confusing. We're not actually making the view translucent. Instead, when we draw the opaque view, we are going to be drawing the image that's inside the view translucently. Again, what, what we're trying to do in all of these cases is optimize so that we're drawing with alpha. We're not using alpha to draw everything with uh, and then copy it back. And then finally, if you have a custom view, um, you can set alpha on the paint. And again, this is another technique to tell us to draw with alpha, not to create alpha on the view. And, uh, and before we go to layers, we have an optimization inside the platform uh, where views can tell us whether or not they have, they have overlapping rendering. So a good example is a text view where you, you only have a piece of text. You know, nothing overlaps that piece of text inside the text view. Uh, if you have a button, the background of the button will overlap with the text of the button itself. So if a view tells us that it doesn't have overlapping rendering, we're able to ignore the set alpha call and we don't create this intermediate buffer, and we do something else instead. So you'll get this optimization for free in pretty much text view and image view, I believe, uh, if you don't have a background. And th there are many, many cases where the optimization might not kick in. But if you create a custom view, uh, you can override that method, uh, has overlapping rendering, and you can tell us uh, to optimize the alpha for you. And then finally, we saw this technique um, earlier in the animation part of this talk. Uh, you can use a hardware layer. Um, so instead of asking us to draw the view every time and then use alpha on that view and then we create the temporary buffer, you can basically force the temporary buffer, which is going to be a texture in the GPU, to be created ahead of time, tell us to use a hardware layer, and then as we fade the view, all we need to do is change the alpha that we're using as we uh, copy that texture around. So this is also a very effective um, use of this. In particular, when you do fades on complex view hierarchies, please use a layer. So speaking of layers, on the Canvas API, there's a method called save layer. Um, you might use it if you write custom code, uh, but you also will use it uh, without knowing it if you use the fading edges capability. Um, so until uh, 4.0, uh, you might have noticed that all our list views have this little fading effect at the bottom and at the top to tell you that there's more content that you can see. Um, this effect is implemented using uh, canvas the save layer um, in some situations. Uh, if the background of your list view is, uh, is a solid color, then we have a special optimization for that. But most of the time we're going to use save layer. And save layer has the same issue as save layer alpha. It can be very expensive. Uh, there are actually two possible situations with save layer. Uh, you, can, you can pass an int, so you can pass flags to save layer to tell us how to save the layer. If you pass zero, if you don't pass any flag, um, we will have to, in software, duplicate every drawing command that you send to the canvas and execute it several times. So if you call save layer two or three times, for instance, like three times, uh, and then you draw something, we'll have to execute that drawing command three times. We will draw the, the for instance, a line in the three layers that you've created, uh, and actually four times, because we'll, we'll have to draw it on the screen as well. So it can be very expensive because you just multiply the number of drawing operations. In hardware, it's even worse because the way it's implemented, we have to do a copy back from the frame buffer. So we're building the frame in the GPU, and we see a save layer come in, and we have to copy what's inside the frame buffer. Because of the way GPU works, um, we might have to store the entire GPU, we have to flush all the commands, make it draw everything, copy it back in memory, and then resume operations. Depending on your GPU, it may be extremely expensive. So on a Tegra device, for instance, it's pretty expensive, but it's still fast enough that you can run it at 60 FPS in most situations. On other GPUs, uh, GPUs from IMG, ARM, and Qualcomm, uh, so if you have Galaxy Nexus, for instance, or Nexus 4 or Nexus 10, uh, that operation will be very, very expensive, and you will see the performance in your application go down. Uh, this is one of the reasons why on some devices we now disable this little fading effect uh, in these views. Uh, so if you have a Nexus 7, for instance, you will see this little fade effect. If you have a Nexus 10, you will not see the effect. And we're working on optimizing this, of course. 
Um, if you pass the flag clip to layer save flag, uh, then the behavior of save layer will be exactly the same as save layer alpha. We have to create a temporary buffer and we have to draw into it. If you're doing that in software, it's not terribly expensive. We're still doubling the amount of work we have to do in terms of blending pixels, but allocating a bitmap in software is pretty, is pretty cheap. We just allocate it on the stack, we draw in the bitmap and we get rid of it at the end of the, of the draw call. Uh, in hardware, we have to retarget the GPU to a new uh, rendering target called an FBO, and this is also extremely expensive on some GPUs, uh, especially the ones from IMG, ARM, and Qualcomm. Uh, we're working, we have optimizations in the pipeline, we've done a lot of optimizations in 4.2 to make that faster, and we have more coming, uh, but try to be careful with this uh, save layer API. Uh, so now I want to talk about Overdraw, and there won't be slides, just a demo. And Overdraw is... Uh, is now, I think, our number one enemy when it comes to performance uh, in UIs. So overdraw is simply how many times do you draw the screen, uh, do you draw the screen over? So the first time you draw on the screen, there's no overdraw. And if you draw a second time, we have an overdraw of 1x. If you draw a, th uh, a third time, we have an overdraw of 2x and so on and so on. Um, the, the amount of overdraw you can do at 60 FPS depends on your memory bus and or the speed of your GPU. Um, and to give you an idea on the Motorola Zoom, so the tablet that we launched with Android 3.0, you could draw the screen about two and a half times uh, per frame at 60 frames per second. So if you have a background in your window, like a white background, and then you put an image on top of that, your budget, your overdraw budget is gone already. And anything you do on top of it will make your app go slower. So how do you uh, first recognize that there's overdraw and how you fix it? So I believe that there's overdraw and how you fix it. So I have a little demo right here. Uh, let me run it. Uh, it's a very simple application. P2V. So it's a very simple application. It's a list of images. Uh, each, image each image has a little border around. Uh, there's a gray background behind the, image, the images. And when you scroll, if I manage to make it scroll, oh, I know why. I had debugging tools enabled. Let's try that again. Yeah, so when you scroll the, the list, you can see a placeholder before we see the image. I'm just simulating downloading an image over the network. So now if I go in settings, uh, not Wi-Fi, this is the new quick settings in uh, Android 4.2 that you see here. So if I go in settings, developer options, and I go enable the feature called show GPU overdraw, uh, we're gonna paint the screen um, each pixel will be painted with a specific color that tells you how many times you've drawn that pixel in every frame. So there's a little indication here that you can treat, but it says from best to worst, blue, green, light red, and red. So if you see a pixel that's blue and it should not be blue, that means that you've drawn that pixel twice. If it's green, you've drawn that pixel three times. If it's red, it's four and, and higher. So now if we relaunch the application, and I have to kill it, right here. You can see that now the screen is tinted and every image is red. It's a, it's a deep red. That means that I'm drawing the screen five times where the image is. And the application looks just fine when you're running it. But here we can see that we're doing way too much work. Um, and it's hard to tell, I think, on the screen, but this, this area here, the little frame, is green. Uh, that means we're drawing three times. And the background, very interestingly, is blue. That means there is, there is something behind the background that we're drawing. So now that we know that there's an issue with our overdraw, um, let's look at this, another tool we can use to figure out what exactly we are overdrawing. So first, let me disable the overdraw. For the next part, you really want to go disable that, that, the developer setting, or, is, or else it's going to interfere with the debugging tool. So we disable it, we kill it, and now we're going to run a tool called Tracer for OpenGL. It's part of the Eclipse plugin. It's also part of the SDK. You can launch an app called Monitor. Uh, and all you have to do is click this little arrow here. You specify the package name of your application. You specify the name of the activity you want to inspect. Um, and then you can say that you want to read back the frame buffer. So the read back will capture what the application looks like after every drawing command sent by the application. So we can see operation by the operation exactly what is being drawn by the application. It's expensive. Um, yeah, be careful, the app becomes very, very, very slow when you do that. 
Um, yeah, reading so, back from the device is expensive, so yeah. the more you're trying to do. And on Nexus 10, because the Nexus 10 display is so big, uh, I've seen it take several minutes to capture one frame. Uh, it also takes hundreds of megabytes of storage. So here I'm, I'm trying to scroll the application a little bit just to force it to draw, and you can see how many frames we're capturing. You can see the amount of data we're capturing. And I'm going to stop the tracing at the end of this frame. Here we go. So now here you can see uh, we can inspect each frame individually, and you can see exactly what is being drawn by the application. And you can even see that the comments are grouped by name of views. Um, so if you look at the tree, you can see exactly what GR commands we use internally to draw every view. Um, every comment shown in blue is a drawing command. So here at the bottom, you can see what the frame looks like um, at the end. And we're going to find a frame that's more interesting. Okay. So here we have a frame that, that shows the application the way it looks uh, when everything is loaded. And if I look at the individual commands, I'm going to take this here. Okay, so every time I click on the draw on the blue line, um, it's going to show me what exactly is in the frame buffer at this instant. So if I keep going, you can see we're drawing the application bit by bit. So what's interesting is here the first drawing command, we're painting the screen white. Uh, I'm using the light holder theme, so we have a white background by default. But the first thing I do in my list view, so here we have a list view, uh, I put a background, my own background on my list view. So now the background is gray. So we drew white, and then on top of that, we're drawing gray. We're not seeing the white anymore, so we've already uh, done too much work because we're, we're covering it. Next, we're drawing the frame for a photo. And you can see that the frame is a, it's a nine patch. Um, it has a little drop shadow, so we have to blend it. But the center of the nine patch is entirely white. It's entirely opaque. So here, we're, already, we're drawing a third time on top of what we had. So we drew the white background, the gray background, and then we're drawing white on top of it with that frame. Next, we're drawing the placeholder. So you know, that placeholder we image we use uh, when we're waiting for the network to send us the, the, the data. Uh, and finally, we draw the photo. So you can see here that there are several things that we're drawing that we should not draw. The white background, because uh, we want a gray one. The placeholder image should uh, go away when we're drawing the photo, when we have the data. And the, the, the white nine patch uh, can be improved uh, to, to save a, few, um, a bunch of pixels. So let's go to the code. We're going to start with the background. So this is my layout. <coughs> Here you can see I have a background for my list view. That's the gray. I'm going to remove this. Now I'm going to go in my theme. So I want to change the background of my window. So I can do that through the theme, uh, and the theme is applied to the activity in the, the Android manifest, manifest. So Android window background. <coughs> there we go. So now if we run the application again, and we run our GL tracer again, We're only going to capture a couple of frames. <coughs> We're still working on the tools. Okay. So here the... F <laughs> All right. Uh, where's my summary? Here we go. Okay, so here you can see that the first thing we draw is the gray. So the white, is, the white has gone away, and we save just one, over, one pass of, of, of overdraw. So next, uh, where will the placeholder. So if we go in the code, so here I have my code, you know, I get a message back from the network that says the image is ready. I set the image on the, on the image view, and I should remove my placeholder by calling uh, set background null. And of course, to do it right, we want to make sure that we, we set the placeholder again when we need it. So now if I run this, oh, sorry, set background drawable. I hate Eclipse. <laughs> really, I do. We run Tracer again. <laughs> so the main advantage of Tracer is that you can quickly see uh, if what you're doing works. So capturing a frame. Okay. So go to frame number four. <laughs> So we draw our gray background, then we draw our nine patch, 
and then we draw our image. The placeholder is gone, and we saved even more pixels to draw on every frame. Finally, uh, we have the, the issue of the, the nine patch. So you have this nine patch, you know, it has the white, uh, but we kind of have to keep the white because, you know, we can see, if we go back to the, to the video, you, we can see at the bottom there's a bit of the nine patch that, that's showing up, and we want to keep that white. Um, what you have to know is that we have a very special optimization in the rendering system where if we find a, a part of the nine patch that's transparent, then we're basically going to ignore that part, and we're not going to draw it. It's not going to count as overdraw. So here, for my nine patch, you can see I have a, a nine patch called frame, and if I open it, this is what it looks like. So that's our white background with the drop shadow. Nothing very interesting here. Uh, and I created a new one called frame with a hole. And if you open that one, there's a tiny, tiny, tiny pixel up, where, up there in the middle here. We have this little hole in the, in the nine patch. And that little hole uh, coincides with the parts of the nine patch that we stretch. So what's going to happen is, as we're going to stretch that, tra that transparent region, the hardware renderer will completely ignore it, and the overdraw will go down. So if I recompile this application, and I re-enable the, the, the GPU overdraw, settings, That's not working. Show GPU draw, yes. Let's relaunch the app. All right. So now you can see that nothing is red. Uh, the images are blue, so that means that we've, we, we have an overdraw of only one X, which makes sense. We have the window background that's white, and we draw the image on top. And the image is blue, which means that we're not drawing anything behind. So the nine patch is not drawing anything. Uh, and if we capture uh, and if you capture with tracer, well, you can disable that first. Yeah, I have to disable the overdraw. I keep cl clicking the wrong setting. <coughs> Developer option, show GPU overdraw. There we go. Run the app, run tracer again. Okay, so here we're drawing an image. So we draw our gray background. We draw the nine patch. And if you can, it's probably hard to see on screen, but if you look very closely, that white section of the nine patch is completely gone. So we're seeing the window background through the nine patch. Uh, so that gets completely ignored. We don't draw the placeholder, we draw the image, and now the application uh, is completely optimized. So it's not going to matter um, optimizing over it's not going to matter. Um, optimizing overdraw won't matter much in, uh, in a lot of very simple applications if you only have a, a simple list view. But uh, on large devices, for instance, a Nexus 10 or a tablet or even some phones, uh, fixing overdraw is going to be very, very important. And usually, as you're fixing overdraw, you're going to simplify your, your view hi uh, hierarchy. You're going to uh, save on memory um, and just on number of drawing commands. Uh, and as you can see with the tools that we have, it's pretty easy to do. So now, a uh, little word on threading. So I think we've said it many, many times, and you probably know it, but do not block the UI thread. It's very important. Uh, avoid uh, I.O. operations, heavy computations on the UI thread. Uh, but at the same time, you, only, you should only manipulate views from the UI thread. So we have several you know, APIs to do that. You can do view.post. Uh, you can create a handler. All those, operation, all those APIs let you uh, run on the UI thread. There's a developer setting for seeing whether you're blocking? Uh, yes, uh, strict mode. Strict mode, okay. Okay, so strict mode. How many of you use strict mode uh, in your application? That's not much. Uh, everybody should use it. So strict mode is a developer tool that you can uh, enable, I think, in developer options. Or you can also control it from your code. And we'll try to automatically detect uh, when you're doing something that you should not be doing. So here you have an example. You can put this line of code in your application. And what we're, we're going to do is uh, every time you do something on the UI thread you should not be doing, we're going to kill the application and print a stack trace telling you what you're doing and where. 
there are many things you can do instead of killing the application. You can just log an error. Uh, you can just flash the screen. Um, but you should really run with that on as much as you can. And every time you see the screen flash or the application die, go fix it, the application. Very often, it's pretty easy to do. And you're going to re get rid of most of the stutter in your application. Very often, what we see when we inspect uh, performance issues is not that the application is taking too long to draw or that the animations are incorrect. It's mostly because while we're drawing, something happens, something huge happens. For instance, we load something from a database or we read a file. So uh, we all run with this internally by default on our eng builds. Um, and the person who worked on strict mode added something specifically for animations because this is really where it impacts you. is not, not when things are static on the screen, but when you're actually trying to move something and you get some hiccups. So he detected when th the animations were actually getting stuttery because the wrong stuff was happening on the UI thread. And the, the message that was logged into Logcat was, Chet hates you. So <laughs> we're pretty serious about this internal, uh, internally, but you should be serious about this as well. Find out where the bottlenecks are and fix them. So if you have a bottleneck on the UI thread, you know, the easiest thing to do is to move that operation on a thread. Uh, I'm sure you know how to start a, a thread. You can also use async task. How many of you use async task already? Uh, okay, a lot. Uh, so if you don't know what, uh, how async task works, uh, it's a utility class where we automatically create a thread for you. We have this method called doing background. So you extend async tasks, you implement, uh, you override doing background. That's why you do your long operation that's running on a background thread. And then you can return a value and that value will be handed back to you uh, in a method called on post, on post execute. And that method runs on the UI thread. So <clears throat> if, you, if you need to do um, a big operation that, that will affect the UI, uh, async task is usually a good candidate uh, for that. Um, now, one of the reasons, yeah, we're gonna talk, I'm going to talk about a change that we, we made in async task. So first of all, if you look at this code here, uh, we have a toggle button, uh, you know, just an on-off switch. And every time the, the toggle button changes value between on and off, we want to uh, write a value into a file. We want to remember the setting that the user has. Um, of course, if we try to write to that file on the UI thread, we're going to uh, violate uh, strict mode. Uh, we're blocking the UI thread. It could, it could have an impact on performance. So here we create a thread. Uh, can you see where the bug is in this code? Or do you even see a bug? Either they don't care or they don't see the I bug. I think they're asleep. Yeah. So here's the bug. Uh, <laughs> So the problem is that we're running a thread. So if the user taps the switch twice pretty quickly, uh, you might run into this situation where the UI thread you know, turns the switch on. We kick off a new thread, thread one, to write that to a file. And then the user uh, clicks the switch again. So now the switch is off. And we start a separate thread. Well, it could be, especially on our new multi-core devices, it happens actually uh, pretty often now, uh, it could be that we're going to run the second thread first. So we're going to write the, the off value on disk, and then we're going to come back and write the on value. So you're going to end up with the UI that says off, but on disk, you're going to save the, the, the wrong value, basically. So to work around this problem, we had to make a change to async task um, a couple of releases ago. So async task used to run in parallel. So if you started several async tasks at the same time, uh, we had a pool, but we you could run, uh, you know, uh, like I think up to 10 async tasks at the same time. And what happened when we started working on multi-core devices, we saw a lot of applications with so very subtle bugs, like they were those weird behaviors, um, and nobody could really explain what was happening until we figured out uh, that the uh, applications were relying on async tasks to run uh, in a serialized way. So now async tasks are serialized. So if you start async task A and async task B, async task B will not run until async task A is done. Uh, and it was never documented what the behavior was, so we felt free to change it because um, it was actually the right thing to do for most applications. If you really, really want your async task to run in parallel, there's a new API, API called execute on executor, and you can pass a parallel executor, and then we're going to run the async task the way you want. Uh, I know that this annoys a few people a lot. Uh, they were very angry. Uh, when I told them that, uh, but really uh, it fixed many, many bugs in a lot of applications. So uh, we talked about this already, but um, respect the UI thread is about n not doing the wrong things on it. This was about the creating. Um, yeah, so something that we that that I've seen people do is create views, <clears throat> yeah. and you know views are expensive, and they want to draw the view in, in a bitmap. 
And if they do it on the UI thread, you know, they block their UI thread a little bit because their view is very expensive. So they have this great idea of uh, doing, of using that view in a separate thread. So the view is not on screen, so they feel like it's, it's uh, perfectly safe to use the view on a different thread. Well, it turns out that it's not. Well, I don't know. It could be. It might be uh, for now, maybe not in the future. So if you are manipulating views on a separate thread, even if the views are not on screen, we cannot and will not guarantee that it will work. So be extremely careful. And internally, especially if you call methods like measure, layout, or draw, those methods uh, rely on, on a lot of flags uh, for various optimization reasons. And those flags have to be manipulated in a very, very, very specific way. And actually, I think there are only two persons in the world who know how to use those flags. And it's supposed to be Chad and I, but I'm not sure we, we, we actually know. Um, and if you do that from a separate thread, um, you know, well, you know how multi-threading works. Like, bad things might happen, and you might leave your application in a weird state. Uh, and it will lead to very subtle bugs. Choreographer was new in <coughs> Jellybean. This was part of the overall uh, Project Butter effort of synchronizing all rendering so that everything happened during vertical refresh. Animations, rendering, uh, surface flinger, everything synchronized to say, you know what? We're about to refresh the screen. Do all your work now so that when we refresh, we get the latest content and we get it at exactly the right time. Uh, it helps smooth out the overall experience of the device uh, a lot. Um, and it also provided a new API that can help you plug into the synchronization system. You get it for free when your views draw or when you run animations and they're just running on the normal sort of timing scheme. But you can also plug into it more directly um, if you're, say, in your own rendering loop. Uh, so that you can take advantage of the same synchronization as the platform has. Yeah, if you want to know more uh, about Choreographer and why it's very important that you use it and what, how vSync works, uh, come to our talk for Better or Worse on Thursday. Uh, better or Worse on Thursday. Uh, we have a little demo. Um, there's actually no point in running the demo, but I really want to run it because I'm very proud of it. Uh, where is it? Choreography. Yeah, it starts with C. Yes. It's cute. There we go. You know what you need is a sheep. <laughs> anyway, so that's all the demo does. You know, it's little clouds floating in the sky and moving. Uh, <laughs> makes me feel happy when I watch it. Um, so that demo was implemented. It's not using the animation framework. It's using uh, its custom drawing. So I, sp I, I create a new thread. Uh, and I draw into a texture view, or I could draw in a, into a, a surface view. It's the same idea. Um, and I'm doing my own animations. And I really, really want to be synchronized exactly with the display so that I'm never missing a frame. And we have perfectly smooth animations uh, as, though, uh, as those uh, pretty clouds uh, cross the sky. Um, and if we go back to slides, I will show you the interesting parts of this application. So first, um, application. So first, um, you have to create your render thread. Uh, we have a very useful class in, on Android called the handler thread. So a handler thread is just a thread that has a special loop inside uh, that can be linked to a handler. So usually when you create a handler, you uh, create that handler on the UI thread and you send runnables to it, you send messages. But you can create your own thread and communicate with that thread uh, with your own handler. So we just create a new render thread, we start the thread, and then we can create a handler and we pass the thread's uh, looper to that handler. So once we have that, we can send messages to that thread through the handler. Uh, so to start my, re my, uh, my, rendering, uh, my rendering, I send a new message to the, to the, to the, rend to the render thread. So I, I call the post method on the handler, I pass a runnable, and I have my own class called the renderer. I create a renderer and I start it. When you want to stop the render thread, you send a message to the, to the handler. Uh, you call stop on the renderer. And at the end, uh, very important, remember to quit the render thread. Um, we had uh, this bug internally when uh, we, someone was working on the new screensavers that we call daydreams. Uh, they forgot to call quit. So every time you start the screensaver, it was creating a new thread. And that thread was just sitting there, uh, making the kernel go slower and slower. Um, and we want to wait. Uh, we're on the UI thread when we call those methods. And we want to wait until the, the render thread is done to make sure that uh, we can exit the application safely. So we just do a join. Uh, and this is what the renderer looks like. Um, so I remove all the drawing code. I'm just showing how to use the choreographer. Uh, so the renderer implements an interface called frame callback. Uh, frame callback is just the listener that uh, the choreographer invokes uh, when it's time to draw. So when, when we start the renderer, we post uh, a frame callback. We tell the, chore the choreographer, please call me 
uh, when it's time to draw. And when we stop the renderer, we just say remove the frame callback. And the frame callback has only one method at the bottom. It's called do frame. And this is where you do your, render, your rendering or anything else you want. Uh, and at the end of the frame, if you want to keep drawing, so usually when you're animating uh, or if you have a game or whatnot, uh, you just post a fr frame callback again. If you don't post a frame callback, you'll stop drawing until you call uh, post frame callback again. So it's very easy to use, uh, and it will make your animation smoother. And it also, even if you use OpenGL, uh, you should use the choreographer to schedule your, your rendering. There's one other unrelated way that you can plug into the same synchronization system, and that's using a new class exposed in Jelly Bean called Time Animator. Yeah. Um, and this is, if you want to run your own animations, there aren't view animations that aren't um, uh, hooked into the whole refresh system already. You can use Time Animator, and that'll basically give you a timing pulse during the same synchronization uh, period of each frame so that you're synced to everything else going on in the system. And internally, the choreograph choreographer, I hate that name, it's hard to pronounce, the, the C class, uh, <laughs> is what we use uh, to drive um, drawing into all of our windows. So the animations, the window animations, uh, scrolling, all, all that is driven by the, the C class internally. All right, uh, so like I said, uh, for better or worse, if you want to know more about Choreographer and how it works and why it works and why it's important, uh, Thursday at 12. So let's talk about bitmaps. Um, this is kind of a big issue in general because a lot of content on the screen comes from bitmaps, the images you want to show, the icons that are on the screen, um, the optimizations where you're using bitmaps, whatever. It's, it's all about the bitmaps. Um, and it turns out that um, size really matters. Um, there's a couple of different aspects of this. Um, one of them is that if you tell us to allocate uh, large amounts of space, you're basically taking up more and more of the heap. And as of 3.0, you're actually taking up more and more of the Dalvik heap, not native heap. So it used to be that you, when you would create a bitmap, we would actually allocate memory in native code, we would be aware of it in Dalvik, but it was really this large block of memory in native code. And you really needed to manage it yourself. You needed to call uh, dispose, Re recycle, recycle on it um, when you were done with it. And sometimes it was hard to know exactly when that was. And then you would run out of memory and you'd get these ugly stack traces. Um, we made it much more deterministic by actually allocating that on the Dalvik heap instead. And now when we need free memory, if there's no reference to that memory, we can collect it on the fly. Um, as needed. However, that means that when those things get collected, you will trigger a GC, and GCs can get expensive, especially the larger these blocks of memory are. Um, and also, there's, there's a bit of wasted effort. This gets cheaper with GPUs, but it's still not necessarily free. If you are allocating this huge image, and what you really want to draw is a thumbnail, or more typically what we see is a really large image gets loaded in, uh, in fact, we, we fixed a bug about two weeks ago for this in wallpapers where we're allocating this huge bitmap, but what we really wanted was something, I don't know, 10 pixels smaller. Um, so on every drawing operation, we would actually be drawing this scaled uh, bitmap version. And you don't really want us to do that. Actually create the bitmap at the size that you want, either by loading in the large thing and then scaling it into the size you want, or actually in the case of wallpapers, we needed to create the assets at the right size anyway. Tell us to load the right size bitmap to begin with, and then you don't even need a single scaling operation. Um, so here's how one way to, to scale to the size that you want. If you have this resource that you got from wherever and you need to load it in at its arbitrary size, and then actually scale it to the size that you're going to use in your UI, here's one approach. You can simply uh, create scaled bitmap. This slide is outdated. That should be bitmap.createScaledBitmap uh, with a new width and height. Um, another way to do this is to use uh, bitmap factory uh, options. And you can use this, and first of all, you ask how big the thing is. So if you use the in just decode bounds option, I love the name of that field, um, then we won't load the bitmap. Instead, we'll go out and query its metadata and say, how large are you? We'll just find out uh, the information, the metrics of the image, and return that uh, in the options data structure. And then you can set another option called uh, in sample size. Um, that will tell it basically how large, to, uh, how large to load into. So you can calculate your sample size based on how large the original is and then paste in this in sample size and then uh, create the scaled bitmap based on that. Um, now the effect of this uh, isn't, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna run a demo. Uh, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna run a demo. Uh, I think it's worth seeing this in action because um, the effects are not uh, necessarily obvious. So this was bitmap 
scaling, I believe. Mm -hmm. ah, yeah. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't do anything, uh, but I want to show the code that's doing this. Um, so we've got the original image up above, and then we have these scaled versions of it with different in sample sizes. Um, and you can see the, the scaled versions are actually several copies at a similar size. So we've got two at this sort of medium size and four at the smaller size, and then two sizes beyond that. Um, so if we take a look at bitmap scaling, um, we come in here. Um, and we're just using different sample sizes from 2 to 10 uh, and saying, okay, now load it with this sample size. And this basically sort of um, tells it scaling factors to use. However, it's not using that as a determinant. It's not saying, okay, now I want you to be, you know, three times smaller, four times smaller. Instead, it's actually going to round down to the nearest power of 2. So you should use in sample size and get used to how it works. It's basically creating optimal power of 2 image sizes for you. Um, instead of just giving you arbitrary sizes. So if you really need a specific size for your UI, then this is not the approach for you. Um, but this is a way to, to it load things. Close. It will get you close, and it will also um, speed up loading so that you're not actually creating this huge thing. You can actually create a much smaller thing, and maybe you scale from there into the true size that you needed. Well, from there into the true size that you needed. Uh, bitmap allocation is also important. It's very closely tied to size. Um, again, it's all about the GC, right? If you are asking for allocations, this is creating heap memory that we will need to collect at some point. And if these heap allocations are large, we're going to need to collect it more frequently, which means we're going to collect it soon, and then we're probably going to cause a performance hiccup at some point. If you're allocating a bunch of stuff during an animation, in the, in the middle of that animation, we may cause a pause that causes the user to notice that your animation wasn't completely fluid. And that's not really what we want. I've seen this recently in applications that loaded a full screen size bitmap on every frame of the animation. And the way that works um, as of 3.0 is we allocate that on the Dalva Keep. And then we come around, and the next frame, they would say, OK, now allocate a new bitmap. And we'd say, well, we don't have enough room in the, in the uh, in the VM for another bitmap, but oh, I noticed this one's free, so I'll GC first to free up the room that we need. So on every single frame of the animation, we would GC, and this, this animation that could have been getting 60 frames a second was getting something more like 15 or 30. Um, so don't do that if you can possibly get around it. Um, the other reason to avoid this is that when you're actually creating new bitmap objects, internally uh, on the hardware acceleration platform, we're creating new textures. So in addition to the expense of creating new bitmaps and loading these things on the fly and the GC implications, we're also creating new textures on the, G on the GPU, um, which has its own performance implications, and that can be dependent on hardware as well. Um, so. One of the things to be aware of, if, if you're running on 3.0 and you know, loading bitmaps used to be faster because they were in native, you're really clever and you managed your heap and uh, you did all the right stuff, and now it's slower because all of a sudden we have to GC to retrieve that memory and the recycle method is you know, not synchronously doing what you want it to, um, then you should also in 3.0 use the new API called uh, in bitmap which basically tells us to reuse a bitmap on the fly. So in this case, um, the person that was allocating a new bitmap every time, instead of allocating that, he could have been passing in the old bitmap and saying, hey, here's some space. Why don't you decode into this instead? Um, so you can use that uh, using the code here. Again, we can go out and decode the bounds so that we can uh, know the size that we're loading into. We can create a bitmap if necessary, um, or we can uh, we can reuse uh, the old bitmap. We can use the in bitmap uh, field instead. Um, we reset the in sample size. I think this is, this is code uh, copied from somewhere else. Uh, so we're sort of making sure the sample size is the right thing, and then we do decode the resource into the bitmap. You were going to say? Uh, I was going to say in sample size is uh, because of your bug. Uh, it, because of my bug? Yes. <coughs> Maybe. Yes, you're right. Uh, yes, so when we actually um, use the in bitmap flag, uh, we, uh, we don't have the correct default <coughs> size for in sample size. You're correct. So you do need to set an in sample size of one if specifically if you're using the in bitmap flag. Thanks for pointing that out. Uh, so that was on the first time when you want to create a bitmap to begin with, and you're going to decode into that bitmap um, and have this mutable thing. In subsequent loads, then you can just point to that existing bitmap and say, OK, now decode the resource into this existing chunk of memory. 
and it'll be way faster. No allocations going on. You're still decoding, which takes time, but you're not causing the GC and texture issues that we had before. Um, I think there was a, um, I think there was a, we can see how this works a little bit in uh, bitmap allocations. Um, so if you tap on the image, it's going to load new images over and over, and then it shows how long it, take to, uh, it took to load the images. And they're sort of between 180 and 250. Um, or we could reuse the bitmaps, and the time goes down. It's still, it's not huge. It still takes time to decode these things, but the load times are somewhere between 140 and 190 in general. Yeah, but remember that those values that you're seeing, it's on the Nexus 4, so it's a really, really fast CPU, and we have a lot of memory bandwidth. Uh, so chances are, you know, on other phones, it's going to be, a, the difference is going to be uh, much bigger. And there, there's also things that this is, tra this is not tracking. This is only detecting how long it took to directly load the image, but there's GC implications, and there's also the following on GPU implications and there's also the follow-on GPU implications that aren't actually factored into that so the the savings are much bigger in general so bitmap drawables uh, when you when you uh, supply drawables in your drawable directories um, you can supply them for different densities and you don't have to supply them for different densities but every time we we find a drawable there's a, we're trying to find a, to load the drawable and it's not available in the density of the display uh, let's say, for instance, you're running on the X, X HDPI display uh, and you only have the HDPI uh, drawable, we have to scale that bitmap. Uh, so you run into all the problems that we just mentioned. We have to you know, create, allocate a new bitmap, do the scaling operation, which is pretty expensive, especially with bilinear filtering. And it's going to slow down the loading of your application. Uh, it used to be a lot worse in 4.1. Uh, we made all, that, uh, all this uh, rescaling uh, happen in native code instead of the Java code, so it, it frees up the, the Darvik heap a lot. Um, so if you can, uh, always supply all your drawables in all the densities that you support. Uh, there is one exception. Uh, Nexus 7 has a weird density called TV DPI. It's 213 DPI. Uh, it's a little awkward to use, so we, w we don't expect you to, to supply drawables in that particular density. Uh, and we'll do the work for you. So if you use the Nexus 7, uh, you'll notice that everything is fast, and that's why we did all, all those optimizations, because we knew that for Nexus 7, we would have to rescale all the bitmaps. And actually, even the framework, we don't have uh, assets in the TV DPI density. We use the HDPI uh, drawables instead, and we rescale them on the fly. Uh, but as much as you can, try to supply all the drawables uh, in all the densities. Bitmap set has alpha. If you create your own bitmap, uh, and you know whether the bitmap is going to be opaque, uh, you should use this method to tell us uh, that it's the case. Uh, so the reason why you have to use this method or you should use this method is because uh, a translucent bitmap has to be blended. And blending is an expensive operation, especially when you run in software. Uh, when we run on the GPU, uh, usually GPUs have dedicated hardware for blending, but even then, uh, there's usually a performance hit associated uh, with blending. So when we have to blend a bitmap on screen because it's translucent or it has transparent pixels, we have to do two operations. We have to read back what's, in the, what's on the screen, and we have to uh, do a computation and then write the result. If the bitmap is opaque, uh, we can skip blending, and instead of having a read and a write, we have only a write. So it's a lot faster. And actually, uh, in software, we can even optimize bitmap uh, drawing, uh, opaque bitmap drawing with a mem copy. And mem copy is really fast. It's usually uh, fine-tuned for every device, uh, and it's as fast as it gets. Uh, so if you can, just do it. Bitmap shaders. Um, I don't know if you, maybe you have not used that class, uh, but if you use a bitmap drawable from XML and you specify, uh, specify a tile mode, so you tell us that you want to repeat the bitmap uh, when you're drawing something, we will create something called a bitmap shader. So it's a class uh, that's part of android.graphics. Um, and it can be used to basically fill a shape with a texture. So if you draw a rectangle or a circle or text, you can use a bitmap shader to fill that shape uh, with a bitmap. Um, if you're using tile mode, or if you're using the bitmap shader class directly, uh, try to use power of two bitmaps uh, as much as you can. The problem is when we repeat a bitmap, if the bitmap is not power of two, some GPUs uh, require us to, re to, re to execute more code per pixel. And it's actually a lot of code. That's the, that's the code that we have to run on the GPU uh, when you repeat a bitmap. And 
if you're not aware, uh, if you're not familiar with OpenGL, that's actually a lot of code to run in your shader. It's very expensive. So if you can, try to, to supply a power of two uh, bitmap to your shader. Uh, we'll try to go real faster. Uh, views are very expensive. Um, this diagram is completely made up, uh, but it gives you an idea of what happens. The more XML attributes you use in your, in your XML file, uh, the longer it will take to inflate a view. So try to minimize the number of XML attributes. If you, it, it happens very often you know, that people leave XML attributes uh, because they do refactoring or copy and paste or they assign the default values. Uh, if, if you're using the default value, don't specify the XML attribute. We will, we will save a bit of time. Um, views can also take up a lot of memory. To give you an idea, a uh, text view, uh, it's probably worse now, but a text view in Android 4.0 uh, takes about 800 bytes of RAM, and that's only the data structure. So if you have text inside the text view, you know, we have, it's 800 bytes plus that string. If you have a background, we have to take into, a, into account the background. It doesn't sound like much, uh, but when your application uses hundreds of those views, uh, you're quickly using a lot of heap. Uh, for instance, at some point I saw uh, the Google Play Store had you know, 800 views uh, in memory at a time, and that's a lot of data just for the structures, because then you have to load your actual data. Uh, layouts, um, that's something I talk about pretty much every year. Uh, try to flatten your layouts. Every time you add a new layout class in your XML file or in your view tree, uh, you make everything more expensive. So, you know, inflation time goes up, uh, use more memory, uh, it, takes more, it takes longer to do the layout, to do the measurement, and to do the drawing. Uh, and some layouts can be very expensive. For instance, relative layout, depending on the option you use, uh, can measure its children up to four or five times. Um, and and that's, that's a lot of time. If you use a profiler to see how, how long it takes to, uh, pro to measure views or to do the layout, you'll see it's not negligible. It's uh, several milliseconds sometimes. Uh, similarly, if you use linear layout and use the layout weight, uh, be very careful because every time you have a child that says it, it wants a weight, we have to measure that child twice. So if that child itself is a linear layout and inside that, that second linear layout you have uh, children with layout weight, those children will be measured up to four times and so on and so on. So as your tree grows deeper and as you use this feature more and more, uh, you're just going to exponentially increase the amount of work we have to do. So be extremely careful with this, uh, this attribute. So I mentioned, it, I mentioned that already, flatten your layouts. We have several tools at, 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 you have several tools at your disposal to do that. Uh, we have the view stub. How many of you knew, know what the view stub does? Uh, oh, okay, shame on you. Five. <laughs> yeah, Five, six, so six, six. Just, <clears throat> just do a Google search uh, for view stub. I wrote an article about it and, and why it's, uh, it's important. It's a very easy way to simplify uh, your, uh, your view tree and to increase uh, the performance um, of your application when it's loading. We also introduced uh, last year in ICS in 4.0 a new layout called grid layout. And there's a one hour talk on grid layout available on parlays.com. But to give you an idea, uh, grid layout um, lets you create extremely complex UIs with only one container. So this screen here that you see, uh, everything below the tabs is composed of only one layout. So if you wanted to recreate that screen with relative layout, it would be very difficult and you would probably want to, uh, to, to, to punch someone at the end. Uh, and if you use linear layouts, you're going to have to embed a lot of linear layouts inside each other. And it's going you know, to take time to inflate. It's going to be expensive to layout. With grid layout, everything can be done with just one uh, grid layout. Uh, the XML file is a little complicated to show you here, so I'm going to uh, take a simple example. Um, this is a very ugly login screen, um, completely made up. Um, and you can create that in, with one layout. Usually, you would use a vertical linear layout, and each row would be a, another linear layout, a horizontal linear layout, to uh, put the, uh, the text field uh, and the label side by side. With grid layout, uh, this is what it looks like. Um, I won't go into the details here, but you can notice that with linear uh, grid layout, you can skip the width and the height on most of the, the children, if not all of them. Uh, so it makes your, your XML files a little easier to read. Uh, and it's actually pretty natural to use. Uh, it takes a while to get used to it. Uh, and I would recommend that you first draw your UI on paper, and then you try to draw a grid uh, in which you can fit all your, your, your elements. Uh, and also check out the official Android blog. There, was a, there were a couple of articles about grid layout and how to use it. List views. Um, so there's a couple of problems that we've seen uh, with people using list views um, internally as well as externally. Uh, one is... Uh, Only a couple? 
There's only a couple that we're going to talk about today. Uh, so th a big problem that people run into is that list view recycles its views. This is done for optimization. Right? If you want to fling a list, if we actually have to create and retain views for that entire long list, there's going to be memory issues, there's going to be performance issues, we're going to be doing all kinds of stuff that we could really optimize instead because the only views you really care about at any given time are the views that are on the screen. So what we do instead is, as views drop off, they drop off into what we call a scrap heap and then we'll reuse those views to populate with new content as new content comes on the screen. It's very optimal, however, it doesn't really work in a system where people want to animate views. Let's say you want to delete one of the items in a list view and so you're going to animate a fade on that item. Uh, on, the, on the view that contains that information. And then the list is flinging at the same time and you can sort of imagine what's going to happen. It's going to fade out slowly. It's going to pop off the screen. The view is going to go into the scrap heap. It's going to be assigned to different content and it's going to continue fading out. Probably not what you are after. Um, so what you really want to do is uh, use the positions of these things and um, more importantly just sort of be aware of this so that you know how to work around it at the time. Um, there's a couple of things that we provide to help out with this. Uh, one is that view property animator is aware of recycle and will set some transient state on views so that they don't become uh, scrap heaped um, until animations are over. Uh, if you want this capability for your own items, if you're not using view property animator, if you're using, for example, object animator, um, then you may want to call a new method called set has transient state. Um, so you can set this on one of the items, uh, one of the views in the list view before you start the animation, then run the animation. When the animation over, is over, uh, then you can reset this, uh, restore the value. Um, so let's run, I think there's a couple of demos here, uh, or we can look at some code first. Um, so if you run an object animator on one of these views, it's in the list view. Um, let's say you want to uh, fade the thing out and then when we're done we're going to set alpha, we're going to restore alpha back to one and we're going to remove the item from the list um, and then we're going to notify data set change. All that looks good, however if the list is flinging at the time we're going to be uh, animating something that is going to be reassigned in the middle um, and weird things are going to happen. You're going to end up fading out some other view with some other content and uh, uh, it's a mess. Um, so. Don't do that. Um, instead, do this. Use this new API that we provided on view called set has transient state. So you're going to set that to true before the animation starts, and when the animation is over, you're going to restore it to false. Um, view property animator does this automatically, internally. Um, so if you want to do the same action with view property animator, you can simply do an alpha zero uh, call on it, and we will set that state internally and then restore it when we're done. Um, so let's take a quick look. Um, so let's take a quick look at a demo. List view. Uh, there's a couple of these things here. List view animation. List view deletion. So list view animations is the one we were just looking at. I think um, here. Go into PDV. Okay. So uh, if we fade. So as I click on items, they fade out and go away, and all that works really well, unless I do that. Well, unless I do this, unless I fling really quickly, and you can see we're side affecting other items in the list that have come on screen, right? So we continue fading out the view, but that's not the content that I wanted to affect. So we fade out this other completely unrelated thing, and then we delete the original item, and it looks really awful. And we're taking this from real use cases. This is not just a made-up demo. Um, if you use view property animator, then we do the right thing internally and we fade out. We, we retain that view so it doesn't go in the scrap heap, it doesn't get uh, reused, it will continue um, getting faded out and then deleted properly and you don't see that artifact. This is really hard to do standing up. Um, if we want to use object animator instead, then we need to set transient state, which is what that checkbox is triggering internally. And again, oh man. I have no flinging capability today. Right, so the right thing happens. Um, in the other case, so there's, uh, this is list view deletion. This one is a bit more subtle. I think we'll probably look at some code here. Are you running list view deletions? Yeah. Yep. All right, so we saw this one recently um, where you select a bunch of items and you want to delete them and they all fade out and get deleted and that's fine. 
Um, but so, let's say you select them and then they get moved off screen, or at least some of them get moved off screen. And then we delete, and we're deleting completely unrelated things. Um, it's kind of the same thing as we were looking at before because basically those views got tossed onto a scrap heap, got reused with other content, and now we're fading out something that has nothing to do with it. The trick is that you, you can't simply run view property animator um, or set transient state to get around this because you haven't actually started the animation. You don't know what you're animating. Instead, like by the time those things are off screen, those views have been reused. You're actually seeing them with other content already. So what you really want to not do is jump through hoops to retain references to possibly old views. I, I don't know how the application even did this. I had to jump through hoops in my demo just to, to demonstrate the artifact. But what you really want to do is, at the point where you decide that you're going to run an animation then delete an object, use the position to determine whether it's actually on the screen. Because if it's not even on the screen, just delete the darn thing. You know, maybe with a delay if that's the artifact, if, the, if that's the effect you're going for. Um, but use the position to determine. You, use the position, then get the actual item, um, and then sort of figure out you know where the view is and what you want to do with it. Don't assume that the view that the user clicked on is the same as the view that you want to actually fade out and delete. Um, I think. Okay. Okay. I was going to show some code. It's fascinating code. Um, but maybe we should move on instead. We'll have to post the demos online. Yeah, we will we'll have to post the demos online. Yeah, we will be posting these. Uh, layout in layout, don't do it. This is something we've talked about before. It's maybe not obvious from the documentation. This relates to something we were talking about before where there's really confusing flags that we have internally to optimize um, all kinds of things, including layout. Layout is incredibly expensive. So what we really want to know is, do we really need, want to, do we need to run layout? So when you call request layout, we'll propagate that information all the way up to the root of the hierarchy so that we'll schedule a layout on the next frame. Well, if the hierarchy already knows that it needs to be laid out, we won't bother propagating because that's a lot of overhead to, to do all that work. So instead we'll say, oh, you know what? Someone's already requested layout. Don't worry about doing this right now. All of that worked great, except if you're in the middle of doing a layout, and you're halfway down the tree, and a view says, oh, request layout. Well, it's basically catching the flags at a very in-between and indeterminate state. And it could put itself in a mode that's a little bit hard to recover from where it has requested layout, but everybody else says, we're done with layout because the flags, sort of the, the chain of command got broken in the middle. Um, so in general, it's a really horrible thing to do. There's some very indirect and unobvious ways to get into this trickery. Uh, one that I saw recently was that during measure, the application would take that opportunity to say, oh, do I need to load any new content? And then it would go out and it would load the content, and then that would cause some views to get created. And view creation causes a request layout, and that would trigger the problem. And they'd get into this weird state that they couldn't recover from until a full refresh because basically the layout flags were messed up. Um, so watch out for this problem. This will actually get better as of a future release. Um, so we're, we're doing some workarounds to get around the issue and not get into this in-between state. But it's still a bad thing for applications to do in general. You should know when you're in layout, and you should uh, make sure that you're not requesting layout at that time. Uh, let's keep that. We talked about it. Uh, don't thrash the cache. There you go. Uh, so it's don't thrashing the cache. It's it's uh, related to creating bitmaps. Um, every time we run with hardware acceleration, every time we see a new bitmap, or every time we see a new object like a shape, you know, like a path or a circle, we have to create internally textures. So we allocate a texture on the GPU, and then we copy the bitmap, the software bitmap, in, into the GPU. Um, so if your application is written in such a way that you never reuse your bitmaps and you always give us new ones, we're going to slowly create you know, new textures, and we're going to fill up internally what we, we call the texture cache, and we're going to use a lot of memory um, for no reason. And as we fill up that cache, w when we need to allocate a new texture because you're creating new bitmaps still, we'll have to go through that cache, remove the old textures that we think we don't need anymore, and then we can create the new one. And we've seen applications that allocate bitmaps all the time, for instance, in their draw method. Every time the draw method is called, they create a new bitmap. So that causes us to all to, on every frame to go delete a bitmap from the cache, then create something new in the cache, and then the next frame we have to delete and recreate. And so we end up doing a lot of work for no reason whatsoever. Um, so reuse your bitmaps and your object uh, whenever possible. Uh, you know, you will avoid GCs, you won't thrash the cache, and it will make your application faster. And I've actually seen, you know, books and tutorials online that, that show the bad thing to do. They show, like, you know, create new paints and bitmaps and thing like, things like that in the draw method. Um, 
you know, if you can remember one rule, don't allocate anything ever. Never allocate. Um, if you want to, s to check whether you're thrashing the cache, you can use this command, uh, adb shell dumps this gfx info and then the name of your process. Uh, and we're going to give you the current state of our various caches. Uh, the first one is called texture cache. Uh, and you can see the maximum limit and the amount of memory you're currently using. And if you see that the cache is most of the time full, uh, chances are you're thrashing the cache. Uh, we have special cleanup capabilities, so every time you switch to another application, uh, we go inside the cache and we delete about 60% of, of, of what's in it, uh, just to make sure that we can recover from thrashing. Uh, render script compute, uh, we'll talk a bit more about it in what's new. Uh, render script, if you're not aware of it, is, it's a, a portable way of uh, running native code, uh, highly performant native code. And on Nexus 10, uh, we can now run render script on the GPU. Uh, and we get really, really, really good performance um, when we do that. Um, we'll talk about, like I said, we'll talk about it more in, uh, in what's new. So you should also check that talk from Google I.O. 2012 called Doing More With Less. Uh, there's a great example of how to do a little bit of image processing with render script, and you'll see it's actually uh, easier to do that kind of, uh, of computations with render script than with Java, for instance. So something else that we've seen in applications uh, during the draw method, do not change the layout. Do not add a view or remove a view, because usually the parent is uh, busy uh, iterating over its children. So if you're confusing the parent by adding or removing children, bad things are going to happen. Uh, I guess we could make the code smarter, but we also don't really want to do that. Uh, so we'll probably keep the code dumb. Uh, and uh, I think that's it. We have 10 minutes left for Q&A, and then we have a few giveaways. If, if you're not in a seat right now, you might want to find one, because that's the giveaway algorithm that we have today. Yes. Is the grid layout, is it uh, Grid layout, is it backported? Yes, grid layout is part of the support library, so you can use it, I think, all the way back to donut or cupcake, something like that. Donut, probably. What? Seven. What? They're saying seven. What? Seven. Seven. Is the seven. Eclair. Okay. Uh, with the gallery being deprecated, is there now any good way to get something like a horizontal input? So, uh, ga oh yes, gallery is deprecated in 4.2. Um, and to be honest, it's been deprecated for years because <coughs> we basically haven't touched the code. So now we made it official. It's like, hey, we don't care. Uh, well, we do care, but you know, it's not. It's not our priority. Uh, so to build a horizontal list view, um, you know, write your own, unfortunately. Uh, you, can, you can look at the source code of list view and see how it does it. Uh, we, have, we have support classes like adapter view and apps list view. Um, they're, they're kind of hard to extend, and we're aware of that, and we'd like to make things better. Uh, so we don't have a good solution right now. Um, so you can still use gallery. I mean, you know, deprecated doesn't mean it's, it, we're going to remove it. It means that we're not fixing bugs in it. Uh, so at least we're honest about that now. Um, you can keep finding bugs about it. We're like, no, it's deprecated. We, we won't fix the bug. Uh, unless we send patches. Maybe I'll take them. Uh, so the Nexus 7 uh, uses something called TV DPI. Uh, it's 213. Uh, so it's not HDPI, it's not MDPI, it's this weird thing. Uh, Google TV uses the same DPI. So your TV is TV DPI, hence the name TV DPI, which makes no sense for a tablet, but you know, get, you can, yeah, TV DPI means tablet something DPI. So the, the question is about Nexus 7. Uh, yeah, the question yeah. is what is the DPI of Nexus 7, sorry. Uh, 10. No, oh, Nexus 10? 10. Oh, so sorry, sorry, sorry. I thought you said Nexus yeah, 7. Probably. It's confusing. We have 4, 7, 10. Uh, Nexus 10 is a 300 DPI, so it's a XH DPI. Uh, just like Nexus 4, Galaxy Nexus, uh, it's a big screen. It's so big, I cannot fit the screenshots on my 30-inch display at work. So the, the demos that we showed today, um, especially the awesome and beautiful ones like you know, red to green animations, uh, we will be posting this stuff online. I'm hoping to do some tutorial videos and, and upload demos as part of that. But uh, keep an eye on our Google Plus and Twitter feeds and uh, our technical blogs is where we would upload this stuff. Any more questions? Looks like no. I think they um, want to get out of here. So we have 22 rows. We have 36 seats. We're going to randomly generate numbers. We're going to give away awesome bug droid toys and maybe a device.
You've all heard about the Nexus 4, right? This is not it. <laughs> but it is a fantastic smaller tablet. All right. So, so seat number 10, row 18. Row 18. <sighs> Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, ten. Ten. All right. All right. Uh, next up, uh, seat twenty four, row seventeen. Could you just raise your hand? So 17 and seat 24. 17, 24. 24. 17, 24. 24, 26, 24. All right. Okay, All right. your turn. Row 10 and seat 20. So 10. Where's 10? Row 10. Seat 20. Who's 20? I just moved seat. <laughs> Smart. <laughs> Row 5, seat 16. 16. So what have you guys? There you go. Ooh. Hey, I'm an engineer. And finally, drum roll please, row eight. <laughs> Everybody else except row eight gets up. <laughs> Seat, wait for it, 20. <gasps> Don't start crying yet, 21. Seat 21. All right, thank you. There you go.